Good morning. We're going to continue our continue our studies this week on building the body. <clears throat> Does anybody need a book? Who's out of town? Anything? Need a couple. We're on lesson number five, which is on page 32. Lesson number five, page 32. Building the body. And thankfully for thankfully for me, this is not a lesson on how to build the body or how to make a body. This is a lesson on building the body of Christ and what that body is and <clears throat> what is the organizational structure of that body and how the body should function. And this morning as we look through this lesson, we're going to cover several things. Uh, we're first going to review the importance of the church. Then we'll identify the leadership of, the church, of Christ's church and determine the manner of order, order, orderliness we should have in our worship service, followed by examining our fellowship with one another, and then we'll look at a few practical applications for our daily lives. As we think about this, I want to pose this question, how important is the church? Well, it's very important. But how important is very important? It's everything. Body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. Well, Jesus died for it. And I'm thankful that you said that because when we look at Ephesians 5, 25 through 30, we find Paul writing to the Ephesians here, the church at Ephesus, husbands are to love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And when we think about this, I have some of these passages, or some of these verses highlighted, and they're just for emphasis purposes. When we think about this, um, the idea that Christ loved the church and gave Himself for her, that He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the, by the Word. Well, what does this mean? That He might sanctify her and cleanse her. Set her apart. What else? If we're to be baptized into Christ, what does that mean? We're putting on Christ. Are we going to be pure? Are we going to be without spot, without spot or blemish? We're going to be pure. You come up white as snow. Uh, we often sing a song. Well, I don't know if we've ever sang it. Yeah, well, I think I've sang it here. Though your sins be as scarlet, Though your sins be as a scarlet. Right? We know that song? They're red. Our sins are red. But Christ died for us, gave himself for the church, so that we can be washed without spot or without blemish, without wrinkle. 1 John 5, 6. This is he who came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only. Water and blood, and the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth. That's right. And when we think about the purpose for this, it's because we are his body and he cares about us. And that's what verses, uh, the second part of verse 29 
And verse 30 says, But it nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does. Talking about a person who loves his, or no one's ever hated his own flesh. Um, if, if for whatever reason my arm was in jeopardy of being cut off, I wouldn't just sit around and say, oh well. It is what it is. I would try to do something about it. Why? Because my arm is important. Uh, just recently, and you probably have done this before, I, I cut the tip of my finger. Well, you don't realize how valuable and how sensitive that one little piece of your body is until you do something to it. Right, Dottie? Dottie had a little incident herself with her tip of her finger. And so if you've ever cut your finger, uh, you know that whenever you go to tie your shoelaces, if you rub it the wrong way, well, it hurts pretty badly, doesn't it? Or if you go to zip up your pants, it hurts because you might hit it the wrong way. Just the slightest little thing can do something to your body. And so you'll do whatever it takes to heal that as quickly as you can so that the pain's gone away. Well, this is the same concept here. Christ nourishes and cherishes the church because we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. He cares about us and he wants us to be without spot or without blemish. So when we think about the leadership of the Lord's church, we need to examine several passages in regards to this. And the first that we're going to examine is Acts 14, verses 21 through 23. Acts 14, 21 through 23. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. That's actually went down through verse 24. But... <clears throat> When we think about this, the leadership of the church, we need to first examine what is made up of the church. What are disciples? Christians? Saints? Followers. Yeah. So we find here, when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, the only way we can make disciples is to do what? Preach and teach the word. That's right. They're students. They're people who study God's word. And down in verse 23, uh, we find them. Who is the them here? Paul and Silas, yeah. Uh, they are appointed elders in every church. Now, notice that this appointing of elders... This is a unique position. It's one that has to be appointed. Well, what does that mean, to be appointed? Well, it first means that you have to meet qualifications. Because can any, just any person be an elder? And we know that because of 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Titus 1, 5 through 9. See, in these scriptures, we find the qualifications of the overseers. But notice, too, that they appointed elders in every church. Now, this is where we have to start using some intelligence here. How many churches are there? There's one. But notice that this passage says, in every church. What is this referring to? The congregations. It's the local congregation, such as those missions back in verse 21. Those at Lystra, 
those at Iconium, those at Antioch. It is important to notice that the pattern that's set forth here is that every congregation, every local congregation of the Lord's Church should have an eldership. And there's another, a number of reasons for this. But turn in your Bibles with me to Titus chapter, uh, let's see here, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. And let's look at verses 10 through 16 just for a second. Titus chapter 1 verses 10 through 16. We find Paul writing to Titus after he has given the qualifications for the elders. In verses 10 through 16, he talks about the tasks that the elders are to do. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not, for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to the Jewish fables of commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Now, we have a section here in which Paul is telling, the, t telling Titus to make sure that the elders are overseeing those who teach contrary to God's word. Is that the whole duty of an elder? No, this is just one segment. This is one aspect of it. But the principle that's being applied here is more than just this specific example. What is the purpose of the eldership? It's to oversee, to protect, to shepherd. And this is just one application of that. And so when we think about this, the eldership that's established here in every local congregation is one that has a duty to the Lord's church to oversee it, to protect it, to watch out for it. Now that would imply that they have to make decisions. And we'll talk about that in a little bit further discussion as we move forward in this. But Moving on, when we look at Acts 15, verse 36, in Acts 15, 36, we find then, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now this is an interesting concept when we look at the leadership of the Lord's church and so forth, and I'm going to tie all this together shortly. Who are the brethren? It's, us. it's the congregation. It's us. It's the members. Brethren, meaning men, and women. This word is unisex. It, it means that brothers and sisters in Christ were there. So Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brethren, our brothers and sisters, in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now, What's the purpose of them going back to see how they are doing? What are they? What is he referring to here? How strong the church is. 
first of all, what were Paul and Barnabas functioning as? Missionaries. They were functioning as missionaries. What's the duty of a missionary? Well, they go on to teach and preach the word, but then they have what? An obligation to do what? Follow up. To check on what they've established in a city. To check on the brethren. This is no different than us at the local level. If I have a Bible study with somebody and I teach them the Word of God, what should I do after that study? Follow up. Why? To see how they're progressing, to see where they are in their studies. You know, I've often heard stories of people who are baptized, who become Christians, and then it's like everybody assumes that they're, they're living the good life. They know what the Bible says front to back. They're a Christian. That's all they need to know. Is that true? How do we know that's not true? Do you know everything? David. That's right. That's right. And, you know, this goes on to say a number of things, too, regarding the fact that um, people who are new to the church, people who aren't raised in the church, and for even that matter, people who are raised in the church, Do we sometimes do things blindly as far as our worship? Do we know why we do things? Now, you take someone who's new to the church and we do things a certain way. They, they may not understand it. They may just say, oh, that's just how it's done. And to some degree that may be true but how are we to worship and go worship God? Spirit and in truth. Meaning we have to understand what the truth is. We need to know why we're worshiping God the way we do. And so this is, you know, going back to Paul and Barnabas here, this is important for them to understand to go back and look and to see how the work that they've established is is being performed or is being followed through with. It's, it's part of their Christian duty to see what's taking place. Yes. When we have a newborn baby in our family, we don't just assume that it takes, takes its course and goes on. We have to take care of that child and, and feed it and nourish it and do all those things. And that's the same thing true with a newborn Christian. That's right. That's right. That same example in, in, in existence doing whatever needs to be done to encourage and exhort and inspire. That's right. Any other questions or comments at this point? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Absolutely. When we look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Yeah, I, I, the, I kind of uh, shuffled some things around in here. So if you're following along in the book, it's, it's kind of a little, little mixed up there. But... Um, 
I will go back and hit those just for a second. But, uh, but I want us to look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there for a second. Give me one second. Sorry about that. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to be perfect man, or to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. <clears throat> Here, Paul writing to the F church at Ephesus, we find Paul writing, and he himself, meaning Christ, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Can everyone be the same? Why? Different talents, different purposes, uh, different strengths. Um, you know, Jaji does an amazing job with photography. Does everybody have a steady hand and an eye to coordinate the shot that she does when we take pictures of the fellowship that we have going on here for the scrapbook, for the last leaders? Uh, Bill, Bill sings tenor. I heard, I've heard him. Fred, can you sing tenor? <laughs> you know, I, you know, we all can't sing different parts. We all can't lead singing because some of us don't have the strength, mentally or physically, to do so. When it comes to teaching Bible class, can all teach? We can all teach, but some of us may lack that wisdom, that expertise, so to speak, in delivering God's word in an appropriate manner. Some of us are limited physically. Can you do what you used to do 30 years ago? I hear Chuck laughing. <laughs> Although, Chuck, are you still walking? He's still walking. Back when Chuck and I used to live near each other, I, I used to see Chuck walking sometimes at like 5 in the morning. Still doing it at 5? Still doing it at 5. Man, that's, that's good stuff. But the point is that not all of us can be the same. None of us are. All are the same. Boring it would be boring. It'd be pretty, you know, bland. But when we think about this and we look at verses 12, it's interesting to notice the purpose that Christ, why Christ gave us to be different things. Number one, we're to train the saints for the work. You see, I may not be a good photographer. I may not be a good song leader. But for someone who is, they can train somebody else to carry on that work, to teach others. But secondly, it's also for edifying one another. When we mentor, when we help one another, when we study with one another, we should feel good inside. It should make us draw closer to one another. 
we should find benefit, benefits that are spiritually uplifting from this work together. But as we move down to verse 13, notice how it's to take place. Or how long it's to take place. I'm sorry. How long this is to continue. Till we are united in faith and have the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to a measure of stature of the fullness of Christ. How long is this supposed to take place? How long are we to continue working in the Lord, teaching others, for the work of the Lord, for edifying one another. Until we're there in heaven. Because well, we need to train each other then. It'll, it won't be about us. It'll be about God. What are you going to say? First Corinthians. Chapter 13 verse 8 to that's right you know when 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 we get to the he when we get to heaven, we're going to be doing only one thing, and that's praising God. Amen. But as we move through this and look at verses fourteen through sixteen, going back, uh, picking up verse thirteen, till we all come in the unity of the, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure, of the stature, of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, just as. Jim just talked about, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things in, into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by, that, by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And so when we look at truth, this is how we are to teach others. We're to teach others in truth, meaning we have to understand what this says. And the purpose is so that we can allow things to grow up and uh, so that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head? We don't want to grow up in the ways of the world, but rather we want to grow up in the way Christ would have us to be since he is the head of the body from whom the whole body is joined together. And the, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share. Each person in that body has a unique way of contributing to the growth of the church. It doesn't matter who you are, how young you are, how old you are. Each individual has a way of contributing uniquely to the edification of others in the Lord's church. And sometimes I believe we sell ourselves too short. We lack faith in ourselves for doing things that we know that we could do. Sometimes we lack the courage to do those things. And we really need to examine that. We're not here for ourselves. We're here to serve God and obey His commands. Amen. And so when we think about that each person has a way of contributing, I want you to imagine this for a second. I want you to imagine your hand and how it functions. If you were, or if you look at my hand or your hand and you, you squeeze it, what's telling it to squeeze? Your brain, your head. That's Christ. Christ is telling us what to do. But what actually composes the hand? Skin, 
bones, tendons, ligaments, nerves, blood vessels, water, calcium in the bones. You see, each component of the hand is unique to making the hand function. That's how the body of Christ is. Each one of us is unique into making that body perfect. Hold that thought because I got about 10 minutes left and we got a ways to go. Sorry about that. Uh, Romans 12. Romans 12, 4 through 8. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in the proportion of our faith, or to our faith, or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, and he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And as we look at this again, we have many members, whoops, many members being us, that's all of us, in one body, that's the church. So, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And this here is referring to the local congregations or the brothers and sisters in Christ. And notice what Paul says here. Let who use them? Us. And this is indicative that Paul is referring to himself and the Romans. So when we look at what talents we have, it doesn't matter who we are, what congregation we're a part of, if we're in the body of Christ, we should do what? Use those talents. Have you ever thought about why do we have a gospel meeting? Is it just so Bob can have a break? Is it just so that we can pay some guy some money to come in and preach a few sermons? Stimulate. It's to stimulate, to grow, to edify us. Have we heard some pretty good messages from gospel preachers? We got some fellows lined up in the future that I hope I live long enough to see or to hear them. Those talents are being used within the church. And notice, again, Paul reemphasizing the fact that people have different talents. And so what I'm trying to get at with this is the fact that the leadership in the Lord's church is made up like this. We have Christ, who is the head of the local body, or the church at Corinth, and that body is made up of different people. You have elders who are qualified men, deacon who is a qualified man and then we have members that minute that member may be a minister could be a teacher or any other member or ministry that's taking place and notice that down here that I've only listed three but this is continuous there could be a whole number of things that are underneath here and not just one person can be these things as we look at this example, when we look at us, church at South Florida Avenue, we have elders, Kenny, Bobby, David. We have deacons, Chuck, Jimmy, Jeff. We have members. And all of these, all of these folks make up the body of Christ. And again, I listed others here because I don't want anybody to feel left out but we could add different things here people who help with the last to leaders the people who go and visit 
These are all works that people are able to do. Some may not be able to. We are what make up the body of Christ. There's only one head, and that's Jesus. So when we look at the orderliness in the church's worship service, 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says, let us do, or let all things be done decently and in order. All things. What does this include? Is it just our worship service? No, it's our daily conduct, our way of, lo our way of living, our way of life. Our treatment of others, our marriages, all things should be done decently and in order. But who determines the order of our worship? It's supposed to be, well, now I want you to think about that for a second. I hear Christ. The elders. The elders. I hear Christ, I hear the elders. What is it? Let me, let me... Let me rephrase my question. Let me ask my question again. No, I'm going to ask two questions now. Number one, who determines what should be in the worship? Christ. Christ. Who determines how we are to order that worship? The elders. The elders. Okay? Because our elders... Members, we don't get to say in what we do in our worship service. That's Christ's authority. But to determine when we take the Lord's Supper or to determine when we have a prayer, whose responsibility is that? Elders. Hebrews 13, 7, 8 through 17. Uh, or, excuse me, Hebrews 3, 7 and 8, 17. Oh, no. Hebrews 13, 7 through 8, and verse 17. I got it now. Uh, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Those who rule over you. Who is that referring to? The elders. The elders. They have a responsibility. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Does the law of Christ, does the Bible change? No. no. And they have to oversee us following what it says. And in verse 17, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give account let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Obey those who rule over you. Is it hard sometimes to accept decisions that elders make? Now, you can speak freely. I, they're, not in, they're not leading this class. Is it hard? Sure it is. Why? Why is it hard for people to be submissive? It's in our nature. I want my way. Because it's my way, the right way. Those guys, they don't know what they're talking about. They're too old. But remember, what was one of the qualifications? Not, an, not a novice. Yes. That's right. That's that's true. People don't want to submit to God, much less elders. You know. You think about this. It's not easy for people to accept decisions that are made when it affects them, their way of doing things. But we have to remember that this isn't an option. We're to obey those who rule over us, whether we like it or not. In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let us, again, this is Christians, consider one another. That means we have to be mindful of each other. 
in order to store up good works, love, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. This tells me, as I'm reading this, that this has been a problem not just in recent times. Because if it was a, time, uh, if it was a problem just of today, would Paul have written about it? Or excuse me, would the Hebrew writer have written about it? You see, people have been forsaking the assembly for a while. Raise your hand if you know someone who forsakes the assembly. You know, every hand should be up in here. Because you look around and you know people who should be here but aren't. What does that tell you? And unless it's you know something that's sickness or illness, but that's a little different circumstance. But people who are just choosing to be here, man, Facebook, man, that tells everybody's business. They know where you are. When you take a picture, it'll tell you where that picture was taken. Sitting at the beach, 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Not where you need to be. But we need to be promoting this attitude of, of coming together, of admonishing one another, exhorting one another, and so much more. We need to be focused on assembling with the saints because of the good and encouragement it provides. It should be a feeling of obligation or habit, but rather a way of, or it shouldn't be just a, a feeling of obligation or habit, but as a way of life because from it, we never know how we're going to truly be affected unless we're there. We had a fellowship yesterday, great fellowship. If you weren't there, you missed out on some good cooking. But we don't know how that fellowship's going to impact us, our children, unless we're there. 1 Timothy 4, 8. For bodily exercise profits, profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Godliness is profitable for all things. See, it goes back to what I just said. If we're not there, we don't know how we're going to profit from it because we're going to be missing out on it. And when we look at our fellowship with one another, for God did not appoint us to wrath. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with them, therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. For God did not appoint us to wrath. Sometimes people have a hard time getting along with one another. But that's not why we're here. Sometimes people like to cause controversy. That's not why we're here. We're here to preach Christ, to be that example. Whether we're awake or sleep, we should live together with him so that we can comfort each other and edify one another. But we need to remember who the head of the body is and who is in charge. It's Christ. See, because of this, edifying one another. We need to love, comfort, strengthen, encourage, work together for that body, just as it's designed. Romans 14, 9, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace, and the things by which one may edify another. Again, this is the way we're to do it. We're to pursue the things which make for peace. Where the way we edify one another, the way we strengthen and fellowship is to pursue things which make for peace. Things that draw us together. Things that unite us. So that we can be one as the body of Christ is. And so when we look at a few practical applications in the last minute or so, we need to respect the decision that the elders make as long as they are within the New Testament law, even though we may not understand why the decision is made. 
Sometimes we don't know the whole, so, the whole story behind the matter. And frankly, it's probably not our business. But sometimes elders make decisions that we have to respect. Decisions that sometimes I'm sure that they don't want to make. But they know that they have to make if they're going to serve God in that role. Number two, no matter who we are as a member of the Lord's church, we are important to the body because each, we each possess some talent that someone else doesn't. We need to utilize these talents, not be afraid, not stand behind our fear, but rather push forward to serve God faithfully. Thirdly, our worship service to God must be in spirit and truth, John 4, 24, but we also need to be orderly in all things. We have an order that's been established by the elders, and those things need to be implemented in a right way. We don't want to have announcements in the middle of the first and second song because that sets things apart. It confuses people. We need to be orderly in all things, including our life, 1 Corinthians 14, 40, which includes our worship. We need to remember that although we want to grow numerically, that's always a good thing, spiritual growth within ourselves is vital to our own salvation. And that can be found in a number of ways, whether it's just through study with another person or whether it's coming together to fellowship with one another on a Saturday afternoon. Again, our worship must be a priority, not a habit. Serving God must be a priority, not a feeling of obligation. And then this is a statement that was taken from the, the book in the introduction. It's actually the last, one of the last sentences in that introduction section. And I, this just stood out to me so profoundly. And then I'll, the lesson will be yours. Fellowship must be viewed as an integral part of the Christian life. For unless individuals come to depend upon the support of their fellow Christians, they will neither grasp the importance of brotherhood nor make the work of the church a priority. And when you think about this, I think about my generation. We have a lot of people in this world of my generation who want to make their lives godly, but only when they don't have anything else to do. What do I mean by that? I mean, when you look at the society that we live in, where does Christ come? First or at the bottom of the list? It's at the bottom of the list. Because if He was first, Society would be a lot different. And it's important to teach our children this because if we don't instill the values in our children, the world will instill their values in them. Thank you for your time, your comments.